Welcome to BIB Today, the daily podcast from the newsroom of Business in Vancouver. I'm Kirk LaPointe, publisher and editor-in-chief. My guest today is the British Consul General in Vancouver. Tom Codlington uh, arrived in the city in February, I believe. Uh, he's, he was the Deputy Director of Strategy at the Foreign uh, Commonwealth and Development Office in London's previous post. Uh, he was the policy advisor, I guess, at that point, advising ministers and doing working with planners on the international strategy for the UK. Uh, he's been posted to Libya before. Um, he's been an advisor in London on Russia policy, uh, also on crisis response, uh, relationships with Europe and North America. Uh, and he came to the Foreign Service from the clean tech sector. Interesting jump. Um, and he, he and his wife apparently love to mountain climb. So um, so tell me a little bit about the mountains. How you, We don't have any here, as you know. We're like a big flat yeah, they did, they did warn me about that Flat before plane. I came. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I need to give that up. Yeah, I need to. Uh, so, but no, you liking them? Mountains okay? Yeah, they're fantastic. I was I was there yesterday actually. Took the day off and um, took the uh, the French consul general up to to Squamish for the day. Oh yeah. So um, make him climb, or did you? Yeah, you guys, yeah. well, he's a climber as well. So, oh my god! Uh, oh, there you are. So you get like a little climbing, little climbing club. Of, well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. yeah. Cliff diplomacy is, yeah. the, is the hashtag. Ah. Uh, you heard it here first. Very nice, very good, very good clip flow. Um, now, uh, it, British politics very quiet right now, like absolutely nothing, well, nothing going on. Uh, you know, leaders can always be counted upon for a steady, you know, slow but steady government. Um, but I want to know though, when when there's any kind of let's just use this hypothetically for a government of some sort, not necessarily yours, but when there is a little bit of trial and tribulation going on, is is it the kind of thing that gets to the level of the foreign service, where there are things that have to be done, or is it, or is it, is the business just carry on and whatever's happening over there is happening over there? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, all, all, you know, our, our job here is to make connections between the UK and, and the place we are. So for me, it's that's BC. So what happens at home matters a lot to to what we do. Um, my my last job actually was uh, part of its function was to prepare the foreign service for changes of administration elections and things like that so uh, it's something that's kind of dear to my heart i'm a civil servant so i represent the government of the day and its priorities uh, when those priorities change then then so do mine yeah yeah it, it, so in a way uh it's it's not as if you're you're prepping people but but what would a typical uh day be like for you now have you have you figured out what the what what a consul just, just general's about. morning to night becomes? Yeah, yeah. Four months in, I've I've sort of got a bit of a handle on it. So, yeah. uh, I mean, look, the meat of it is uh, is making connections. So I probably spend about half my time uh, trying to build connections in the kind of trade and investment space. Mm-hmm. So helping um, UK companies to to export here and to do business here. Mm-hmm. Um, something like one hundred seventy thousand jobs in Canada rely on. UK companies, mm-hmm. so helping that to work, um, getting investment from Canada into the UK to help us to, for instance, kind of build out our kind of net zero plan in the UK and so on, which, you know, again, has got very strong BC links. Uh, the rest I spend uh, thinking about science and technology collaborations on things like clean technology, mm. uh, how do we bring together kind of universities in the UK, universities in BC, to think through the kind of big challenges. Um, and then the rest is building relationships across the community. So when you, uh, when you examine what the top files are right now in, in the role, uh, because you're here, you represent uh, BC, but also Yukon, you know, you've, you've got some Northwest Territory kind of uh, piece to it as well. Um, what are the top main files? So at the moment, uh, the top file is uh, the trade negotiation that's going on between uh, between the UK and Canada. Yeah. Uh, round two started yesterday mm-hmm. uh, in Ottawa, uh, and I'm hoping that will basically be the the catalyst for the, the next trade. stage in trade relations between yeah an agreement the UK right yeah. uh, an agreement uh, uh, fundamentally um, what is what are the BC or the Western relationships that are important to that trade deal, do you think? What what kind of, what industries do you think, what sectors do you think will matter most when uh, the two two parties are trying to form some kind of an arrangement yeah. that would have most resonance here? Yeah, so, so BC is quite different from the rest of Canada for that 
for that reason. So yeah. um, the sectors that really matter most to that trade agreement in BC, um, primarily it's services. So business services, education services, health services, mm-hmm. there's um, you know, life sciences. So those kind of service sectors have really strong links and really strong interests and in things like recognizing each other's qualifications. So if you qualify as a architect, consultant, doctor uh, in one jurisdiction, mm-hmm. you know, can you practice in the other? Do you need to redo your qualifications? That kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then there are certain sectors which are really strong between BC and the UK. So for instance, the UK is the number one European destination for lumber for BC and other kind of wood products. Mm-hmm. That's a huge industry here. It has huge kind of political resonance. Um, so that I imagine will be, be part of the, the relationships I'll need to build and, and yeah. kind of bring to the table. I mean, uh, the, the passport is, uh, you know, and, and the common uh, um, membership in the Commonwealth, of course, are things that, uh, that people talk about a great deal. Um, are, are, we, are we kind of in a space now where, as a country, you perceive that we, we, need, um, we, we need an influx of labor? We put the pause button on immigration for a couple of years there during the pandemic when it started. Uh, and there is some catching up to do. Does that mean that, that then there becomes a, um, a slightly different approach uh, that that uh, is taken to bringing people um, bringing people to Canada to do uh, seasonal work, uh, longer term work, and all that. Are you noticing that already? Uh, I mean, talent and uh, finding and and retaining talent is the number one thing that yeah. businesses in BC that I've spoken to so far have told me about. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm hoping that kind of closer connections with the UK, which is a very similar jurisdiction in many ways. Um, will will kind of help that so better business mobility, um, using the kind of hybrid world as yeah. well. Yeah, um, I, I, I hope that will be part of the part of the answer for people. Yeah, it, when um, when you're taking a look at the um, at the job itself, uh, do you have do you, do you get um, invested in a in a particular set of priorities that are directing you to do things, and then have a bit of a space where you wish to put your own particular stamp on it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so let's, let's do the latter here first. What's the stamp that you want to put on? The thing, that, the thing that's really excited me so far from, from four months here is, is the clean tech space because there's so much innovation happening in BC. Yeah. Um, there's so much potential for, for kind of join up and, and collaboration because likewise the UK is really investing in that as well. Yeah. So I'm hoping over the next few months to start building some connections, particularly in the maritime space, mm. um, where uh, you know the amount of shipping that comes in and out of the Port of Vancouver, the Port of Prince Rupert, yeah. BC in general, uh, suggests that there's there's an opportunity there for BC and the UK, which is also a huge shipping nation, yeah. uh, to really crack one of the one of the really difficult problems. Uh, in in mitigating climate change, yeah, it, well, it is it is perceived as as one of the top three problems, if you want to call it that, in terms mm-hmm. of uh, uh, shifting into a much more uh, clean tech economy, yeah, and all that. What what do you think is is um, possible to be helped here that uh, that say uh, governments can do together, or that uh, can be facilitated with industry? Yeah, well, I think it has to be it has to be facilitated with industry, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, to my mind, what we should be doing is creating the environment, the support structures, uh, the kind of ecosystem where industry could come together and work on solutions to decarbonize the maritime sector. So, whether that's uh, kind of over the longer term, uh, signaling intent towards kind of hydrogen infrastructure so mm. that shipping can run on kind of clean hydrogen, uh, whether that's uh, just shifting the way that we um, you know, the kind of engine technology that we use in, in, in ships, whether it's about the regulation that we adopt for vessels that come in and out of our jurisdictions. So there's lots of different levers that we can we can kind of look at. Um, but if we do, if we kind of take a coordinated approach between big jurisdictions, then it's much more likely to work for industry. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's interesting that, you know, that you would have wound up in a, a place like Vancouver um, with the industry background that you had uh, prior to going into the Foreign Service and all that. Um, did you ever expect that you would kind of go almost like a bit of a loop of, uh, you know, 
back to discussing some of those issues that brought you into uh, into public service in the first instance. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a very happy coincidence, right? Um, and it's a reflection that that Vancouver has got a lot going on. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's you know energy and and climate and um, the kind of systems we need to build in order to. To, to tackle climate change has been one of the things that's kind of really excited me throughout my career. So, yeah. Um, as far as um, issues, we we now, of course, are having a, a serious passport issue. You can you can tell us. Um, is it the kind of thing where people are um, coming by and, and asking about being able to get over, uh, you know, and, and trying to deal with plans of family reunification and those kinds of things? Is that still a big part? Of what a consul general has to do for its for its own citizens. Uh, so mo- most consulates, including ours, we've uh, we've outsourced how uh, passports and visas work. Mm-hmm. So we have a big office in London that takes in applications, often virtually from around the world, and, and does all of that. What we do as a consulate is uh, is emergencies, uh, and um, over the last probably six months, because essentially no one applied for passports over the pandemic. Mm because I'm traveling. Yeah. And then, uh, I don't know if you've done this, but people book their first plane ticket and they look at their passport and, and they go, go, oh, so, uh, I'm, I'm not... This expired. I'm not permitted to travel, am I? Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, we've seen that across the world. We've got something like 150% the number of passport renewal applications at this yeah. point in the year that we would usually have. Yeah. Um, so there's, you know, waiting times are longer and therefore, you know, more things are becoming emergencies. Uh, yeah. So that's that's how it then affects the consular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, when that, um, well, th- does that mean you end up having to staff up, uh, having to do additional hours, those kinds of things, in order to make sure that people can can get the facility that they need? Uh, yeah, some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm curious as well uh, about the uh, your perception of the uh, relationship uh, between British Columbia and what you're discovering about that. Uh, with the UK. I mean, we were, in a lot of ways, a very British-centric part of the world for quite some time. We are now much more diverse. But there is a, a pretty strong traditional sense here still of, um, you, know, you know, when we hosted a Commonwealth game for good reason. I think that was a big, big uh, event for this community. Um, are you getting around to also see the British community, in a sense, and not just meet all the industries, but, but the actual the people who are still here who have, who have roots there. Yeah, absolutely. Look, how I, how, I, um, how I talk about Vancouver and British Columbia to London uh, is as uh, one of the most diverse places in North America. Um, I think, I mean, I'm not sure about the source of this stat, but I think it's the most Asian city outside Asia as well in yeah. terms of its yeah, yeah, city and makeup. So uh, that's very much how I approach Vancouver. It's, it's, you know, it's a it's a it's a hugely diverse place. That said, um, I think something like half of British Columbians claim some form of heritage from mm. the British Isles. So there's lots of connections there as well. Yeah. Um, and there is a British community here that that I keep up with. But my unlike probably most other consulates here, we don't have a dedicated kind of function to look after. You know, the sort of expat yeah. scene. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in BC because yeah. Brits here by and large get into the community and get on with it yeah yeah um, and, and they don't look to us for for that kind of support yeah. so um, I'm, I'm also curious uh, with with every new person who comes here uh, but what it is that is surprising them about the place they've arrived would would have been the surprises for you yeah I mean look I, I grew up in Ottawa so um, ah. Okay. The, probably the biggest surprise there is um, there isn't very much for winter in the city, um, and there's a lot more it's going not on. The Ottawa winter, I can guarantee you. That. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot more going on in Vancouver than there is in Ottawa. So, um, yeah. I, for me, what surprised me was just the pace of how events uh, events take place in Vancouver. Every few days, there's something else kind of exciting popping up, which is which is going on in town. Whether it's you know a, a conference on clean technology or you know a really interesting kind of speaker coming through uh, you know that kind of thing so um so yeah i think the buzz is what surprised me really buzz oh, that's good uh and and then uh is there um what, what do you most miss 
do I most miss? Um, I'd say there isn't enough uh, British cheese um, Is there available. Ever? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah, uh, that's good. Um, and then, and then, I guess the last question is, uh, because you've only really experienced the role in the pandemic, or perhaps with a little bit of a subsiding of the pandemic, do do your counterparts talk? about how the job has changed during the pandemic and wh- what it is that you've kind of wound up in and how differently it might have existed three or four years ago. Yeah, so I um, I started, I think, a week after restrictions started to loosen here. Yeah. Um, at, essentially, it feels like all of the other Consul Generals started at the same time with a new job mm-hmm. uh, because it was so different during the pandemic and the virtual events and... Um, you know, endless time on Zoom. Uh, now it's it's very different. So yeah. uh, it's all about trying to build connections. Sometimes the old-fashioned way, yeah. like we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and kind of rediscovering the kind of those skills. But you know, like everyone, uh, you know, we've had turnover during the pandemic. In terms of people have moved on, and we've recruited new people. And there's a, you know, I think every everyone in this role has got a, uh, you know, a kind of skills to rebuild. Mm-hmm. in terms of how to do that in-person diplomacy. Is everybody in your office in your office, or are you still doing some hybrid? Yeah, yeah. so we do two to three days in the office. Oh, okay. Um, so we're, we're flexible. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, our job is to make connections. So uh, that involves being in person. It becomes uh, very difficult to do across Zoom all the time. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, um, you know, if you had to take a look at, at what your objectives would be, uh, if once you're com- once you've completed the role, um, is there something? Is there a, a goal in mind for you? Gosh, in four years' time. Well, um, I mean, FIFA's FIFA World Cup is coming probably um, towards the end of my time there, so I think I'll be a good yardstick. Yeah, um, an England game maybe, uh, or even a Wales game uh, in Vancouver. That would be a good thing to aim for. Yeah, yeah. You might get a friendly ahead of that. Yeah. You never know. Let's say you get one in 2025. Yeah. Um, but but as a goal, um, when you have a, a work goal as well, do you have a work goal? Yeah, um, I'm taking it in a kind of six to nine month chunk. Mm-hmm. The world changes pretty quickly these days. I think yeah. if you had me here in what 2018 yeah. and asked me what my goal would be in four years' time, um, what? Yeah. So I think you know, let's let's see how it goes. My my first week here was also the week that Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, I could talk to you about that. Uh, you, if you, you like, yeah, yeah. I mean, you you, yeah. you know. You, you're, you've been a policy advisor on this. Uh, how has that changed back home to begin with? Um, so I think probably the way to describe it is um, the, end, the end of an era. Mm. Uh, I think we'll look back on Russia's invasion of Ukraine as, as being almost, if not as significant as the pandemic in terms of the history books. Mm. Um, and it's, it has completely changed the sort of priorities and focus of of the uk foreign service just like it has the canadian foreign service and mm-hmm. and and everyone else really um so uh you know our prime minister said i think yesterday that we have to prepare now for a for a long war mm-hmm. um because uh russia is showing showing no signs of um uh of kind of rowing back no, or, or wishing to discuss, yeah, a, a kind of a, a settlement term. Exactly. Mm. Um, so it it uh, it falls on us to ensure that Ukraine has got the um, the kind of strategic reserves mm-hmm. uh, to uh, to to survive that and ultimately prevail over the longer term. But yeah. it's um, there's there can be a frustration when you're as far away from it as we are here, where we have really the second largest diaspora of Ukrainians yeah. outside of Russia. Uh, and wondering, you know, how it is that it can help. You know, is, in, in your view, I, I know you don't want to comment too much on what Canadians can do, but is there time now with a protracted conflict for Canada to um, have a, a stronger energy assistance, a stronger uh, assistance for things like wheat, uh, for any number of exports that makes some sense now that, that it's not... It's not a matter that by the time we get there, it's kind of settled. Uh, that where where we you know there is a multi even a multi year approach taken because as you know, the crops aren't planted this year mm. in Ukraine. 
you know, next year will be, will, and the year after will probably be very harsh regardless of what the conflict looks like in terms of people having a struggle across Europe for their food and for their energy. You know, is there time now, do you think? Um, Can Canada get in that game? So I think Canada's already heading to, to be in that, in that game, right, to supply energy to, to Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, again, to, to increase its kind of export capacity uh, on on kind of foodstuffs, I, I think that's a solid it's a solid bet. Just because the world is going to need more of those things anyway, mm-hmm. I think uh, the fact that it's a, you know likely to be a protracted conflict probably means that uh, there's time to invest in you know with greater thought and with greater depth and sustainability into things like hosting refugees into things like humanitarian assistance and into things like provision of lethal aid. Yeah. Um, where uh, Canada and the UK have both been very forward-leaning, uh, but sometimes it's felt a bit sort of grab bag, uh, whereas actually now it's time to start putting in place really long-term programs in all three of those yeah. that, can, that, can, that can be sustained. So, you know, we've just announced a program we're going to be training 10,000 Ukrainian soldiers uh, a month mm-hmm. uh, from next month. So, you know, what can, what can Canada do that is going to make that kind of sustainable long-term contribution? Yeah. It wouldn't have surprised you, the invasion, I, I assume. It wouldn't have surprised you. Um, has it surprised you either um, about how uh, forceful the pushback has been from Ukraine? Um, I think that there are two things that really surprised me about the conflict. One was uh, Russia's willingness to press on um, in the face of the, the casualties it was, you know, it's still receiving mm-hmm. in the face of the kind of, you know, practically unanimous international condemnation, the damage to its interests elsewhere. Um, uh, and, and yeah, the other has been the, the force of the Ukrainian resistance, which is, you know, hugely inspiring. Um, uh, and also hugely sad because... You know, if the conflict is going to be protracted, it will be the Ukrainian people who, uh, who, who bear the, the brunt of that and the price of that. Yeah. Um, when, you, uh, when you look at where um, the Ukraine could wind up fairly soon, end up in the EU, you know, it, something that is not there uh, for you right now. But, uh, but uh, if you can put your hat on as somebody who understands the EU... Or understands the benefits of it. What what would Ukraine get out of the EU uh, that would be that would at least be uh, uh, of significant um, assistance to it in the short term? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it's not really one that I can uh, I can answer. But uh, you know, among among the many benefits that you know. It might get would be um, you know access to some of the EU reconstruction funds mm-hmm. uh, and some of the kind of pots of money that are shared within the EU that might more easily go to Ukraine um, and uh, you know I think probably the main thing is is the signal of that long term yeah. commitment uh, which you know the UK and Canada who would, you know, neither of us are members of the EU we can also make in different ways yeah. uh, in ways that Ukraine values and that show that kind of come what may, we're not going to give up on them. When you uh, are able to reflect on this now, can you see that uh, the West, uh, and to some degree big parts of Europe, were taking somewhat for granted this, this kind of peaceable border with Russia that, that was not going to be disturbed terribly much? I mean, Kirk, the war started in 2014. Right. Um, you yeah. know, we trained twenty five thousand Ukrainian soldiers between twenty fourteen and mm. uh, and the invasion. Um, you know, Canada's been you know through its contributions in NATO, you know, hugely reinforced in Eastern Europe since twenty fourteen. I mean, this is this has been here a while. Um, but you're right. You know, we've we've kind of grown used to the idea of a frozen conflict um, in Ukraine rather than uh, what we what we see now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we could talk about Russia all day, uh, but, uh, but you've got another job. Um, although I wonder, do you, do you still ha- have discussions back home 
about this. You know, you're still tapped in uh, for you know a little bit of insight here and there yeah, on policy. All, yeah, all the all the heads of mission around the world for the for the UK Foreign Service kind of check in regularly and 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 talk about this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I hope you can come back uh, during the course of your time here. Uh, help us understand what you're learning about us, because uh, it, it, uh, it always pays off, I think, to have fresh sets of eyes tell us a little bit more about ourselves and all that. And, uh, and I'm glad you're here on Indigenous Peoples Day. Yeah, I was going to I was going to mention that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, a, it's yeah. a great day for our country with a greater and greater understanding of it. Um, we're I think we won't run this on Indigenous Peoples Day, but this is the day that that uh, you're here. So thanks a lot for coming in. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. All right. I'm Kirk LaPointe, publisher and editor in chief at BIV. Thanks a lot for watching.